Hey there, this is Ms. Clemmie, and welcome to the podcast on the endocrine system, where we'll take a closer look at how um, regulation is maintained uh, in our bodies. Now here what we're looking at is two primates, and they're cuddling, they're trying to keep warm, and what's probably being released right now in their bloodstream is a hormone called oxytocin also known as a love hormone. It's a pretty interesting hormone, uh, plays a lot of different roles, but we know that um, when we're around a mate, oxytocin helps to um, calm us down, relieve anxiety. Uh, it, it also helps to form the mother-child maternal bond. And so the, a, lot of, a lot of new research being done in that oxytocin and what it does um, for our attraction and our social uh, interactions. However, in general, oxytocin, along with all the other hormones, are pretty important. Um, and if we look at the big picture here, we notice they are chemical messages. They're not electrical like the nervous system. And what's so great about them is that they can use them to communicate with the whole body. So when we're talking hormones, we're talking big picture ways to regulate uh, processes that happen in lots of different areas of the body and we can coordinate all of them together. So we're talking things like metabolism and growth, development, maturation and reproduction so we can get those all working on the same page. What I really do want to focus though on this particular podcast is how, how hormones help to maintain homeostasis. So we're going to look at a model that looks like this. And so this model is called the negative feedback model, and that means if conditions in your body get too high or too low, there are hormones to help bring it back to the middle, help to maintain homeostasis. So we're going to look at two examples of a specific body condition, say your blood sugar levels, and what happens when they get too high, um, what gland senses that, releases what hormone to do what to, to your body, what kind of response and so on. And the same is true if your a condition gets too low. Now, say we didn't have these opposing hormones here, these antagonistic hormones. Say we just had one and it was secreted too much. We have a term for that, hypersecretion. And if a hormone is not secreted enough, we have hyposecretion. But let's take a closer look at an actual negative feedback model. And we will do the first one, blood sugar. So the first condition, we'll say the blood sugar has gotten too high, like say we've just eaten a meal. And if that is true, the pancreas will sense the blood sugar levels and release the first hormone called insulin. It's actually released in the cells um, of the pancreas called islets of Langerhans in the beta cells of those islets. And that insulin has a short trip to the liver, tells the liver to store some sugar as glycogen, but it also has a longer uh, trip to all the other body cells to tell them to absorb some sugar. And it goes to your brain to help to tell it to reduce your appetite. Now if conditions get too low in your blood with all this sugar, um, this pancreas also senses that. So if you've gone a while without eating a meal, and then it will go to the alpha cells in the pancreas to release, produce and release glucagon. And then glucagon will go to your liver and tell your liver to take out some of that sugar in, from storage and put it back into the blood. Um, and it will also trigger feelings of hunger. So that's how a negative feedback system works to maintain blood sugar levels. The same type of system can be used to regular blood regulate blood calcium levels. So if the conditions get too high, your thyroid in your neck senses that and releases a hormone called calcitonin. And the particular response that's elicited is that calcitonin goes to your bone cells, your osteocytes, and those osteocytes have little receptors on, for calcitonin on them. And so the calcitonin locks in here. Here's my calcitonin, perfect fit and tells those cells they need to start storing calcium from the blood in their bone, in the cells. And once that happens, blood calcium should return back to normal levels. But if it gets too low, a different gland, the parathyroid, like located really close to the thyroid, is going to sense that and release an opposing antagonistic hormone called PTH. 
And PTH is going to do the opposite. It's going to go to the bones and tell them to release calcium back into the blood so that there's always a balance of blood calcium levels. So let's look at negative feedback systems, uh, but there are also positive feedback systems. And the example I'm going to give you here is back to our love molecule oxytocin. Positive feedback now always pushes away from homeostasis. It doesn't return back there. So if we see this, oxytocin is responsible for contractions and when you're in labor. And so the initial trigger for oxytocin oxytocin is that the, the baby's head pushing on the cervix. And so that sends an action potential to the brain, to the pituitary, tells it to release oxytocin. Oxytocin then goes to the uterus, which stimulates contractions, and then the baby pushes more, and there's more oxytocin, and so on and so on. So you keep getting farther and farther away from homeostasis until that baby is born. Now what I want to do is go through a variety of other glands in your body that help to maintain and, and regulate homeostasis. And the first one is thyroid. And I did mention earlier the thyroid is, is used to release calcitonin or produce calcitonin for blood calcium levels. But it also plays a role in maintaining metabolism and it releases a hormone called thyroxine to do that. Unfortunately, for to make thyroxine, your thyroid needs iodine. And so if you don't have iodine in your diet, your thyroid tries and tries to make thyroxine and in doing so becomes very inflamed. And what you see in these pictures is a severe case of what's called a goiter. It's just a thyroid um, that can't get enough iodine to make thyroxine. And so now we solve that problem by putting iodine in our table salt. So we get plenty of iodine. Another endocrine gland is the adrenal bodies located right on top of the kidneys. The inner portion is called the medulla, and this is probably a hormone you're pretty familiar with, adrenaline, also known as epinephrine. And adrenaline sim simply uh, triggers your sympathetic fight or flight response, and it also helps by releasing um, excess sugar to your muscles so they can make more ATP. The outer portion of the adrenal gland, called the cortex, is responsible for, produ for producing two hormones. Here we produce aldosterone. Um, this helps to, us to retain sodium if our blood gets too dilute. And the other one is glucocorticoids, can stimulate your sugar production as well as in, plays a big role in the inflammatory response. And just to top things off here, the, the sex glands, and for gender specific, we have um, in the estrogen and progesterone that's released for females in the ovaries, and the developing egg also can release these hormones. And in males, the testes produces testosterone. Um, and finally, before we get to the master gland, we have the pineal gland, located in the brain, releases melatonin, and its main purpose is to keep our body's internal clock and our circadian rhythm going. Now finally, the big master gland, the pituitary. You do not need to know the posterior from the anterior, you just need to know the pituitary really does release a whole set of hormones that have lots of effects all over the body. So for example, um, the thyroid we know produces two hormones, but the pituitary is the one that tells the thyroid to start producing those hormones. So the pituitary releases thyroid stimulating hormone to tell the thyroid what to do. Um, the pituitary also releases something called uh, adrenocorticotropic um, stimulating hormone. That one you don't need to know for specifics, but you should know um, the medulla and the cortex and what the hormones they produce. Anterior, anterior pituitary releases human growth hormone, HGH, it reaches out to our bones and muscles. It releases reproductive organs um, that trigger the production of estrogen and testosterone and progesterone releases um, prolactin, which plays a role in uh, stimulating milk production. It releases a hormone that helps with uh, melanocytes and the melanin production. Here's our lovely friend prolactin with uterus contractions again. And then this one from the posterior pituitary is released is called ADH, and it helps us retain water. So if our 
blood becomes too thick and concentrated with salt and solutes, we'll keep water to try and dilute that. It's the opposite of aldosterone. So let's look at our master gland um, and a lot of hormones in a short amount of time. So thanks for listening and I hope you found that very helpful.